Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon in Shanghai and good morning in Switzerland. Welcome to our Inno Swiss China Camp webinar. Today our topic is Shenzhen, the rise of China Silicon Valley. My name is Li Jun Zhang. I'm the head of innovation and entrepreneurship at Swissnex China. Swissnex China is Swiss science consulate in China. We are active in bridging Swiss innovators with Chinese counterparts. The video you just saw is a highlight of our 2019 activities. In the past few years, we've witnessed growing demand from Swiss startups, researchers, and hardware innovators who are looking to Shenzhen, as Shenzhen is playing a key role in science and technology innovation in Great Bay Area of South China. Therefore, in next one hour, we'll have two speakers who have in-depth pen penetration, will share the insights on the opportunities in Shenzhen innovation ecosystem. Our moderator today is Mr. Marcus Prandini, Swiss visiting professor in Shenzhen Technology in University. Now it's time to begin today's webinar. Firstly, let's welcome our moderator, Mr. Marcus Prandini. Marcus, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Li Jun, uh, for uh, today's introduction uh, of our webinar about uh, Shenzhen, the rise uh, of China's Silicon Valley. My name is Marcus Prandini, currently uh, in Switzerland and doing this webinar, this moderation out uh, of uh, uh, the home office where most of us, I guess, currently are working. Let me shortly today introduce the topic of our webinar uh, to you, mentioning the goals we want to cover for the audience and then go over to the introduction of our two speakers. Having developed from a little fisher village back in the 1980s, Shenzhen is now one of the global hotspots for entrepreneurship and innovation, best known also as the Silicon Valley for hardware. It's not only the young and ambitious population Shenzhen is known for, but also for its uh, almost unlimited opportunities for the production and purchase of hardware and electronics. There is a saying in Shenzhen that goes, one week in Shenzhen is like one month elsewhere in the world. Companies which are using the business and innovation ecosystem of Shenzhen are well familiar with the four S of Shenzhen speed, skills, savings, and scale. In today's webinar, we want to receive insights into those four S's of Shenzhen. We will explore what the opportunities, but also the hurdles are when we are a Swiss or foreign startup that wants to operate in Shenzhen. For the audience, we want to cover the following three goals respectively questions. First, what are the specific characteristics of the business and innovation ecosystem of Shenzhen? Second, how can I as a Swiss or foreign startup increase my competitive advantage by using the innovation ecosystem of Shenzhen? And third, what can we expect from Shenzhen or China in the next two to three years? We thus also want to dare a forecast beyond the COVID-19 situation we are currently all going through. We have two proficient speakers uh, today with us, Jan Schmeikal and Ji Ke, who will address these goals and questions for us in their presentations. Before I start to shortly introduce the first speaker, one remark uh, for our audience throughout the webinar, you can always enter your questions down here in the Q&A button with Zoom. I will address and discuss these questions with our speakers at the end of the webinar. Let me thus now shortly introduce to you our first speaker, Mr. Jan Schmeikal. 
Yang has been active in China since 2015. With his degree from the Beijing University, HSBC Business School, he is advising multinational companies, small and mid-sized firms, as well as startups in entering the Chinese market to build up and grow business. Since January this year, Jan also uh, operates uh, his uh, own company, Jan, also known as Your China Guy. His company helps uh, businesses to accelerate uh, their activities in China. Jan is a very talented networker who brings together people from all different backgrounds, as he has proven in managing organizations like the Startup Grind or communities like The Dinner. Jan will today speak to us about the topic, building business in China as a foreigner. Jan, I hand over to you. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Markus, and thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And of course, Swissnext for organizing this, uh, this sharing today. Uh, let me just share my screen with you real quick. Uh, I need to find the presentation. Yes. Okay. So I hope you can see this. Uh, so we have, uh, we have 20 minutes today. And uh, as I said, I'm very excited to be here to share my personal experience and, and hopefully, you know, give you some cues uh, on uh, how to approach Shenzhen, how to approach China as a, as a foreign company, as a foreign startup, because I've been through this uh, journey myself, either with my own company or with the companies that I've been working for over the past uh, five years that I've spent in China so far. Uh, just a little bit, little bit about myself. So I'm originally from Czech Republic. I came to China, as Marcus mentioned, in 2015. And I came, came here first because of two reasons. One reason was study, because I was looking for a special experience. Uh, at that point, I was finishing my bachelor degree in Czech Republic. And uh, I was looking for a special experience to continue my studies. And, and so I chose China and uh, ended up choosing Shenzhen and HSBC uh, Business School here to continue my studies and to learn something more about China and Asia as a whole. And uh, the second reason why I came here was uh, my first business. So still, uh, when I was finishing my bachelor degree in Czech Republic, uh, we started a company which was focusing on uh, sourcing products, getting uh, electronics products, uh, uh, brands like Xiaomi uh, from Shenzhen, from the Huachan Bay market. You have probably heard about this market and, and I guess she is going to tell you a little bit more about this place and you know what Hux does there. But basically I was spending a lot of time in that place, negotiating with a lot of suppliers, getting the products and then taking those products, shipping them back to Europe and, and selling, selling over there. And so that's how my, how my story, how my China story started. Um, right now, uh, just, just long story short, Right now, as Marcus mentioned, I, uh, I work with a couple of companies and uh, some of them are very, very big companies. Uh, one of them could be familiar to you and probably is Credit Suisse, which is the investment bank from Switzerland. So I actually help them to execute their projects on the ground in mainland China because, of course, they have a huge office in Hong Kong, but uh, they have limited capabilities in mainland China, which is probably going to change now because they, they uh, recently uh, receive um, the, the confirmation that they can, they can invest more in China and they're actually going to take over their JV locally in China. And so uh, I think uh, exciting times ahead. And uh, a couple other companies, I've also worked with Singularity University and, and the founder, Peter Diamandis, and, and I have been helping them to figure out China, the investment side of China and even the business development side of China. So uh, that's, that's basically what I spend my time on even these days. Um, I want to I want to start my presentation with uh, you know asking a couple of these questions and of course we're we're talking about Shenzhen today uh, and uh, you know I have only spent my time in Shenzhen so honestly speaking I cannot really give you much more perspectives about Beijing Shanghai I've traveled to those places but I've never lived there I have never done business there and so it's very uh, it actually makes uh, a true sense for me to talk about Shenzhen and uh, you know I would love to just start with uh, with some overview I think. Marcus mentioned that, uh, you know, that, that Shenzhen basically transformed uh, completely from zero to hero, I would say. So, uh, you know, you can see some of these pictures is, uh, you know, that uh, Shenzhen was actually established as a city uh, from, a, from a fishing village in the uh, 1980s. 
And uh, you know, you can see on those two pictures that I'm sharing on the screen right now that it basically looked like a small village before, and it transformed into this mega city that actually attracted me as a as a as a person to stay here because when I first got to Shenzhen those five years ago. I uh, absolutely didn't have a clue about, you know, what Shenzhen is, what China is all about. And when I came here and I saw these skyscrapers and the speed and the hunger that the local entrepreneurs have to actually execute and build things, then uh, I was like, this is the place to be. And I have to take this opportunity to, to learn uh, as much as I can. Uh, this is just a quote uh, from, uh, from, uh, from a local professor. Uh, is that it really speaks to the you know to the pictures that I just showed? It's uh, it's that Shenzhen really transformed you know so quickly, and it speaks to the speed, the Shenzhen speed. And I guess we're going to talk about that, uh, or G is going to talk about it a little bit later. So I'm not going to go into details, but uh, you know the massive transformation from 300,000 people to 10 plus million, and maybe even 20 million now. Uh, it's just uh, incredible. Uh, Shenzhen, of course, is a very strategic place, you know, and uh, that's not only for, for China or, you know, for entering this region or, you know, uh, you have probably heard about the Greater Bay Area, which is being pushed quite a bit by the Chinese government, by, you know, the Hong Kong government as well. And, you know, all these governments and all these regions uh, are kind of trying to work together to, to really build up this area. So you can see on this map, this is just an illustration that really Shenzhen is a really good hotspot, not only for, you know, the innovation, the manufacturing and stuff like that, but even the connectivity in the region. And that the fact that you live in a tier one city in China, but you still have access to, you know, all the neighboring cities and uh, the economies and even the customers, because Guangdong province, which Shenzhen is located in, is actually one of the major contributors to the entire Chinese economy. And so uh, when you look at the GDP, when you look at the money that people make here and the money that people are able to spend on your products, potentially, if you want to bring your products from Europe, from Switzerland to, to China, is actually way above average in China. So, so it's really a strategic place. And I'm going to talk about a couple more points uh, uh, just now. So I already mentioned it's an innovation hotspot. And of course, you know, I... I, I'm not going to really go into detail because I think what Hux is doing, you know, in this regard is, is really incredible and, and she definitely has uh, many more insights, you know, on innovation, how to build innovative products, especially the hardware products in Shenzhen. And of course, you, you probably know that uh, companies like, like Huawei, Tencent, BYD and Shenzhen Bus Group and all of these huge companies that actually have done something that nobody else in the world has done. You know, I will give you one example. For example, the Shenzhen Bus Group. It's actually a company that manages the largest e-vehicle and e-bus fleet in the world. So when you come to Shenzhen, all the buses are, or most of the buses are all electric. Most of the taxis are all electric. You cannot really see many more taxis that would be the, the conventional engine uh, kind of kind of taxis kind of vehicles and so this is uh, this is uh, this is the hotspot this is this is where it happened this is where you know the government decided we're going to push these innovations we're going to try these innovations at scale and if it works we're going to learn from it we're going to copy paste that model to other places in China and potentially even in the world and so uh, this is just a couple of examples why Shenzhen is really truly innovative uh, hotspot. And you can find many examples, many, many examples that uh, you cannot find anywhere else in the world. And, you know, the world is trying to learn from China, from Shenzhen right now. Uh, great connectivity. I already mentioned the Greater Bay Area, but I also want to make sure that I mention the connectivity within the entire region. What I like about Shenzhen personally a lot is that it's very close to Hong Kong. And of course, the situation right now is not the best anywhere in the world. You know, there is not really free movement of people. I cannot really go to Hong Kong right now from Shenzhen and come back because it's, it's, uh, it's, not, prohibi it's not allowed right now. But in general, when we look at the, the things, when, when things are normal, uh, then the, the great connectivity uh, to, to Hong Kong is just incredible because you can easily fly around the region. You can come back and, uh, you know, you can build truly global business uh, that is both you know, on the Asia side, very good connectivity to the entire APEC region, but at the same time, you're actually in mainland China, 
which matters, which truly matters if you want to build up the China business, those connections and stuff like that, because uh, you cannot really execute projects. You cannot really execute anything in China without having the face-to-face -face interaction, without, without having the, the, the boots on the ground. And so Shenzhen really truly gives you this connectivity and this asset that you're both in China, but you can also very easily travel around. You are very close to Hong Kong and you can you know, execute a truly, truly global business from here. Um, bootstrap your startup. I think this is very interesting because we, we hear about these things all the time. And my personal experience is that you can have a very good life in Shenzhen as a foreigner while not spending too much money, you know, be it rent, you know, for example, I've, I've lived in many different places in, in Shenzhen. And of course, I'm not going to mention the university campus because that's, that's an outlier. But uh, when I was moving around Shenzhen, you know, I was paying somewhere, you know, between three to 7,000 RMB per month for my, for my apartment uh, when I was sharing, it, was sharing it with other people or when I was just living by myself. And I think, you know, this is really uh, not, you know, you cannot really find many places, many hotspots, many, 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 many hubs around the world that will allow you to do the same thing. And at the same time, uh, the lifestyle, of course, is improving every single day, every single year. There is more things you can do in Shenzhen, even apart from work. And, and, and I truly consider Shenzhen as the best place to, to bootstrap your startup. Again, if you're trying to get into China, if you're trying to build the, the APEC facing business. Blue Ocean, what I mean by that, uh, I mean that even though uh, everybody and even myself, uh, I'm talking about how amazing developed city it is it still is true that there is not so many foreign startups being based in Shenzhen compared to cities like Beijing Shanghai uh, Shenzhen is still kind of you know running under the radar when it comes to people really being excited excited to come here and I think this is the blue, blue ocean opportunity because if you have something unique if you want to contribute to the ecosystem you can truly own it you can own it. And I think, you know, Hux is a very good example of that. You know, I, I of course, there's many more platforms in Shenzhen, and I, I will mention some of them just for information. But, you know, what Hux has been working on very hard over the past couple, uh, couple of years is that, you know, they truly own this, you know, hardware ecosystem kind of, you know, in Shenzhen. And, and so if you have something unique, if you have something niche, and you want to come here and contribute and build up a platform, you can still do it in Shenzhen uh, relatively easily. Uh, compared to other places around the world and in China. So this is what I mean by blue ocean. Uh, of course, we need to be practical, right? So, you know, uh, I, I mentioned all these great things. And of course, the timing right now is not the best, right? So, you know, even if you really wanted to, you cannot come to China right now because, uh, you know, foreign nationals, uh, even though you have valid visa, work visa, residence permit, whatever you have, you cannot come to China. You cannot cross the border. And so this is something that, of course, you have to keep in mind. And if you guys are planning to build a business in China in the, in the near future, you should definitely keep an eye on, uh, you know, these policies and these announcements to be able to plan in advance and to be able to react to these things, you know, as they change, because they, they change literally overnight. So uh, you want to make sure that uh, you have it covered so that you don't end up in a, in a, in a bad position or in a, in a bad, bad spot. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, you know, I, I, I don't really know, you know, what context you have, but I'm sure that many of you have heard about, you know, these programs and accelerators that China is, is opening basically probably every single day. Uh, there is many incubators and accelerators all over China. And I'm now not meaning, you know, the accelerators like Hux, for example, I'm meaning those other, you know, government funded uh, accelerators all over China that, uh, that China is trying to you know, use this platform to attract you, to attract foreign startups, et cetera. Uh, you know, you really have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, not all of them will serve your purpose. I'm not trying to say that you should completely neglect them. I'm not trying to say that you should not care about it. That's, that's not at all my, my, my purpose of mentioning it, but it's really about you have to do your homework and you have to ask people that have probably been through these programs and incubators before actually making commitment, because what can really easily happen is that if you make one commitment, if you make commitment, for example, with an accelerator, with a government funded or government supported accelerator in a Futian district in Shenzhen, that means that you will only be, you will only be able to access the resources provided to you by this 
accelerator, incubator, or by this location. You are not going to be able to freely move around. And it may be difficult to access other resources at the same time because all the districts and all these incubators and accelerators in China, they literally compete with each other. You know, they compete with each other. They try to attract startups and that's their KPI. And uh, some of them do it better than others, of course, as, as always. But uh, you really have to be aware of this, of this thing that you have to do your homework. You need to know those people very well. You need to double check if what they're saying that they can do for you in China or globally is truly the case. Maybe they have done it before. Maybe you can reach out to some of the companies that have been through these programs and you can ask them, you can validate, you can do your due diligence. You really have to be very diligent when it comes to due diligence for anything that you do in China. You know, and uh, you know, that's, that's of course because of the language barrier. That's of course because of the culture barrier. That's of course because of many other things that we can discuss further or I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. But there is many things that, that uh, many variables that basically will, will determine your success in China or potential failure. So this is something that uh, I want you to have on the top of your mind anytime you, you, you try to do something in China. Uh, just, uh, I think this is one of my last slides. I don't know where, where I stand in terms of time, but you know, I, I'm happy to, happy to talk uh, later and happy to answer any, any questions. But basically, I just wanted to put everything on one slide to make it very clear. And so, uh, you know, as you can see, I have, I've put down some, some resources, communities, accelerators that you should probably be aware of. And there's many more. Honestly, I would not be able to put uh, every single person and every single accelerator that you should know, you know, uh, on a list or, or one slide, that's just impossible. There is so many even individual uh, entrepreneurs or individual consultants or people, local Chinese, uh, you know, hustlers or whatever you want to call them that can really help you to take your business in Shenzhen and in China to the next level. And so again, this is just the starting point. I would say that you should be aware of these platforms. You should definitely check them online and you, you should see what they're up to. Every single platform is good for, for something, is not good for something else. So again, you have to do your due diligence. You have to ask around. And you know, the community is probably going to be your best resource. Uh, talking to the people that have done it, been there, that talk to people that come to China, Shenzhen every single day, asking the same questions as you are probably going to be asking. You want to talk, talk to those people, to those hubs, to those connectors that, uh, that can help you because that's going to be really the, the high speed train ticket for you, uh, you know, for in case of, uh, or in terms of understanding the, 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 the local ecosystem. Uh, the things that you should do, and I've mentioned a couple of things already in my, uh, in my previous slides, and it's really the, the homework, due diligence, you know, seek help, seek mentorship. Don't be afraid reaching out to people on LinkedIn. I think there is more and more people on LinkedIn right now, even from the local Chinese circles that want to help, that want to get in touch. And again, you know, sometimes you may, you may want to double check again, you know, if what they're offering is real, you know, I get requests every single day from people that want to attract people like you, foreign startups from the China side. And, you know, I don't know what they're doing. I need to do my due diligence as well, because, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to get lost in the, you know, in the kind of uh, the ocean of information and, and people that are doing stuff. But, uh, but it's really important. You know, forgetting every, everything you know about executing your business in Europe, in Switzerland, compared to executing your business in China, it's very important. You have to be open-minded. You have to be open to changing your approach, you know, the way you communicate, the way you negotiate deals. It's really different. And if you can, if you can get help from somebody else, that's awesome. If you want to do it yourself, you can do it too, of course. I did it myself at the beginning, myself as well. So it's definitely possible. It just takes time and, you know, a lot of learnings and sometimes failures. So you need to be, you need to be open for that, for that challenge and for that experience, you know, uh, be practical, you know, and it's, it's, I mentioned specifically the fundraising in China. It's very important to be practical about this because, you know, I get these requests all the time from, from startups, you know, asking me, Hey, can we fundraise in China? You know, well, it really depends. Most of the funds that uh, you would probably want to get money from or, you know, whatever, they will either not be able to invest in your company unless, uh, yeah, I will just finish, that, finish this up and, and I'm done. Uh, so, uh, you know, most of the funds, local Chinese funds will not be able to invest in your company. 
because they don't have the vehicle and because you're for, for in a foreign wholly owned enterprise or you have entity in, uh, in Hong Kong or entity somewhere else, they are not going to be even able to invest your money. So, so double check again. And uh, one last thing that I'm going to say, contribute to the community and really, you know, not only seek help, but try to offer your insights and the help to support because that will truly give you an advantage here. And uh, failures is basically, you know, the opposites of the, of the things that you should do. Um, I have one more slide about the competitive advantage, but I am run, running out of time. So uh, let's, let's discuss it later in the Q&A if you're, if you're specifically interested about something. So that's my input and I'm happy to connect with all of you afterwards. Well, Jan, thank you uh, very much for these uh, insights into the innovation ecosystem uh, of Shenzhen. Also, we see that you have uh, rich experience uh, in uh, navigating in this uh, great Bay Area, as well as advising startups who have an interest uh, to possibly enter China and uh, grow their business. We have uh, a couple of questions already. I would like to take one before we go uh, to the second speak, uh, speaker, G. Absolutely. Kirk. This question is from uh, John uh, Evans. Uh, he uh, refers to your um, sayings about the current situation uh, in China, where it has become difficult uh, to enter right now as a foreigner due, due to the current uh, COVID-19 situation. So in general, how do you see then the risk right now and probably also in the coming two, three years? to do or to still do business in China? It's a very good question. And you know, there is no one way to answer it, honestly, because uh, every single person will give you a different perspective. It also depends on which industry you're in or which industry you wanna focus on in China. You know, there are certain industries that are much more sensitive than others. And uh, certain industries like, for example, cross-border e-commerce or bringing some high level, you know, high quality products to China and selling it to Chinese consumers, they're highly sought after. So actually, if you have those specific products, you know, people will still be willing to do business with you and they will really appreciate if you're actually on the ground in China uh, to do this business, to execute this business with them. So, you know, all in all, like I'm still pretty positive because, you know, of course, myself, I'm here, I'm staying here. I'm not really planning to, to go anywhere unless, you know, something major happens, who knows. But uh, I'm still pretty positive that especially places like Shenzhen that are much more open than Beijing, Shanghai, and many other small cities are really open to having you, to having a foreign startup that can truly add value to the ecosystem, be it you're bringing an interesting technology, you're bringing an interesting knowledge. So for example, you have specific degree from a specific university that is, uh, that is really unique in this ecosystem, okay. then you will be very much welcome. You know? And so you know, there are of course platforms, you know, universities, accelerators, incubators, and many different ways how you can get into China, you know, and how you can contribute. So it really is about the, you know, maybe about the last slide that I mentioned. If you have competitive advantage, if you're bringing something unique, and if you're open-minded enough that you are willing to just give it your all, you know, to, to figure it out, then I believe that you will always be welcome and there is always gonna be a way for you to succeed here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, we uh, go on uh, now to our second uh, speaker, our second uh, topic uh, of today, which will be presented to us by Mr. G. Ke. I want to give you a short introduction to his uh, person. G. is the program director at Hux Accelerator in Shenzhen. As you might know, Hux is one of the most prominent accelerators uh, in the Greater Bay Area, also due to the tech magazine Wired, which has featured Hex back in 2016 in a widely successful documentation. With his uh, background in mechanical engineering, G is the perfect match for Hex to drive its Hex Speed Accelerator program, of which we will hear more still in his uh, speech. Being a techie at heart, G is deeply connected to the innovation ecosystem of Shenzhen, and this also gives us the frame for his uh, speech uh, today. Shenzhen, the hardware Silicon Valley, leverage the hardware ecosystem to boost up your startup speed. 
So G, we are looking forward uh, to your insights uh, about Shenzhen, the hardware Silicon Valley. The stage is yours. Thank you, Professor Marcus, and thank you, Ian, for um, for for introduction. And I'm uh, brief on the on the Shenzhen uh, ecosystem. And of course, thank you, Swiss Next, uh, to um, for inviting me uh, to give a quick presentation on uh, investment trends and market opportunities and how foreign startups can utilize the ecosystem in Shenzhen. So before I begin, I'd just like to say a few words about um, uh, hacks and SSV and what, what we do as a foreign organization, as American VC, why do we come to Shenzhen and set up a, um, a, an office and set up an accelerator that help foreign startups uh, to flourish uh, in Shenzhen? Uh, we started in 2012 uh, in um, in San Francisco, and then we we ended up setting our majority of the base in Shenzhen to really utilize the ecosystem here. And then the reason for that is that as hardware startup, um, it's imperative that you create as many iterations as possible at a such short time as possible. So the maturity of startup is defined by number of iterations, not by how long you've been in existence, right? And then so Shenzhen is the best way to do that. And Yen already uh, mentioned a couple, couple of these, and Professor Marcus, of course, mentioned the four S's of Shenzhen. But essentially that you will not feel like a team of two or a team of three, but how many team you have, you feel like a team of 10 to really reach that one week equals one month kind of uh, speed that you are uh, you're, you're able to achieve. So over the past seven years, Hacks have uh, invested more than 200 companies, uh, more than 200 startups, including um, several Swiss companies. And we have funded a lot of funders from ETH. Uh, we had a really enjoyable time working with all the uh, Swiss entrepreneurs. So uh, if, you're seeing, if you're doing a hardware startup and if you're seeing you're applying, uh, we're, we're very uh, excited to look at your applications and what you're making. Um, what, what we are, what, uh, I think you have already prelude to this, but uh, we are, we're not really an accelerator. We're essentially a VC and we fund and support physical um, intersection between physical and digital early stage startups, right? So the reason why you hear hacks as an accelerator is because as a VC, we believe that, you know, uh, for early stage startups, money is just purely not enough, right? It needs a bit of acceleration. It needs a bit of de-risking in order for you uh, to succeed to the next level. And then the, the best way to, to form all of these kinds of stuff is to utilize the localized ecosystem. That's why in the beginning of the slide, we have uh, San Francisco, we have Shenzhen, and there's Tokyo, right? So essentially, the way for hardware startups, the, the trajectory for that is to utilize the hardware ecosystem in Shenzhen, utilize the financial uh, institutions in, uh, and also some other uh, VCs in San Francisco, and utilize the business opportunities in Tokyo. And then that's how you complete the circle of having a ability to utilize localized systems. Of course, as well as we have other locations in New York, in London, um, in Shanghai, in Taiwan, uh, all utilize the local ecosystem to best support the startups. Um, what we do, our mission is to enable funders to build physical and digital uh, that shift industries, right? So we provide investments, we provide collaboration, and we provide community. Just give you a quick sense of how startups utilize the ecosystem in China, utilize the uh, ecosystem in Shenzhen, and also how we can um, really bring speed to this, uh, to, to, their, um, uh, to, their, to their business. Is, um, this is a good example. So this is a company we have invested called UIBot. And then when we invested in them in September 2017, this is what their prototypes looks like, right? It is a, it's essentially it's a, something that you guys probably are using in your own startups or in your own research. And then uh, the product itself uh, is very relatively rudimentary from a exterior perspective, but it's quite advanced interior. So they're doing slam logic uh, on a testing platform. We, we, uh, and we invest in them. Um, and then they came to hacks, which is this prototype. And then three months later, this is what they have. So essentially, from that uh, very rough uh, exposed prototype, they have found a use case, which is using a robot uh, using technology to inspect uh, 
tires. Uh, actually, this is uh, for the Sinzen bus uh, company uh, Jens was talking about. And they are able to find supplier for robo arm, the robo arm uh, for the suppliers for the G, uh, RTK GPS systems. And then uh, along with hacks, our resources, our engineers help them develop the uh, industrial design, the storyboard, and we also help them shot video, right? And also get them to a partner with Michelin to uh, to start doing tire inspections for the customer. As a startup, it is imperative, critical to find the first customer, find the first correct customer. And that will help you lead to additional funding and help you to lead to additional business opportunities. So pretty much right after um, that pilot test, we raised a seed money. And then three, year, three years later, they're now a Series B company, right? And then uh, they've been doing robots for clean buses, for inspection, for logistics, uh, etc. And then that's kind of speed I'm expecting from from a, from a research prototype to a demonstrable, pilot testable, and then going to and then a pilot test within three months, right? And that's enabled by Yan uh, Manjian de which Bay, which which is where Hacks located. Essentially, the speed generates from the ease of doing things and the ecosystem supports you, right? So the ease of doing things, I'll just give you a quick example. So I, I'm actually Canadian, I'm from Canada. And then I came to China because to do my first startup, right? In Canada, I would imagine the same case in Switzerland, is that when you want to buy a part, you know, let's say you want to buy a bearing, right? Even though SKF is uh, just around the corner, but if you want to buy SKF for bearing, it takes a while. Or if you buy ST32 chip, it takes a while to get to your place, test it, modify it, put it in and see if it works or not. In, in, in Hacks, for example, uh, because we're located in Huachang Bay, if you want an SC32, what you do is you walk downstairs, eight floors, you go to the market, you pick one up, you pay them, you bring it up, 10 minutes later, you have your own SC32, or bearings, or BLDCs, or a uh, flash chip, or the, the newest um, 3D scanner from, from, uh, from Microsoft or Intel or whatever. So that kind of speed really helps you. And the ecosystem that helps you to, so you can free up your time to do what's critical for your value proposition. So for example, if you want to do 3D printing, you might have 3D printers in your, in your workshop. We're actually invested for form labs, but we do not have form labs in our workshop because we utilize the outsource, right? We don't want uh, the founders to spend their money or time to, uh, to, to 3D print something, change the filaments, etc. Just turn it out. And when it comes back, you have something that can be deployed. All right, so your time is valuable and your time needs to be put into things that can accelerate your business. All right, so over the four years, we have invested more than $100 million into those three areas. Consumer, um, even though, you know, for a time that we're known as a Kickstarter accelerator, that's uh, absolutely not true, uh, mainly because our, our Kickstarter uh, investments are, um, they have the best PR and marketing, right? So we actually are very focused on B2B and very focused on healthcare. Um, our breakdown of investment by region is uh, uh, mainly Americans and Canadians. Europeans um, are since about 20% and we invest 20% in Chinese, right? And as I come back to the question, some of you guys already had asked in q and I'm happy to dive into a little deeper about how foreign companies um, thrive in China and what, what kind of uh, finances or how to set up comp companies. We have some experience of that and I'm more than happy to answer those during the Q&A session. Um, again, those three locations, uh, how we utilize those three locations. And uh, I want to save more time for q and so I'm going to skip the slide. But essentially, I want to uh, um, skip a couple of slides, so I'll jump to this. So, um, so every year, we have more than 1,500 startups applying for our program, and we ended up investing 40 of them. So that's roughly 2%, 2.5%. Uh, and then we, we learned a few things about what it takes to run a successful startup. All right, so I just want to share some of that. So first, you need to be clever. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a given, but uh, I want to do that for an example, right? So this is a company called Somatic. They came to Hex. Uh, they also went to YC. And so what they do is that they clean bathrooms, right? They clean bathrooms automatically, right? If you, if you think about it from the hardware perspective and software perspective, to do this, to clean bathrooms autonomously, that is really, really difficult, right? And, but if you want to demonstrate a value, if you want to demonstrate a value to other investors, you can put millions of dollars in your product. So what they did, 
is that they actually um, program the robot. Uh, they don't program the robot. They actually do this through VR. So they train this VR, and because students in, in uh, commercial buildings, it's pretty much the same. Uh, so they train it once using VR, and then just continue doing that by the plan pass. Right? So in this case, they're very clever. They do not have fantastic sensors or programming that enable them to do this autonomously, but it's purely trained through VR from someone. Uh, so, the, so the bathroom is actually in Pittsburgh, but the, the trainer is in you. Right? Preservation is the most important aspect of uh, getting, um, getting, uh, getting to, to, to drive success in a startup. So this is a company called, um, that's a lot, uh, it's, uh, it's from the States and then it's from Ohio and then uh, Purdue. Uh, and then what they do is that they can do dry cleaning in five minutes. This is their first proof of concept. Uh, Nishan, the CEO, started in his uh, Purdue dorm uh, last year. And then they slowly become something that's a bit more, more advanced, right? Now they got server server rack that's doing the dry cleaning and then they do they do testing in dormitories in in uh, in hotels in uh, in gyms just to get many many feedback i finally got a pretty sizable uh pilot test in one of the largest hotel chains in america and what happens COVID 19 right so hotels doesn't even operate anymore so but they persevere they persevere they look for all communities and they got uh they pivoted and then now they are doing dry cleaning for uh for the movie industry movie and film industry so this is at disney and then essentially they're cleaning wardrobes for disney movie production All right so third is domain expertise All right domain expertise is something that uh, some of you have right now some of you do not have and then which needs to be acquired so this this is an example of a company that we invested uh called uh, smart shepherd in australia they are able to identify a um a, a, a need for uh, pedigree identification in raising sheep. And then they know this because the CEO is uh, have done for 40 years manually, right? And then, so he has a contacts, he has the networks, and he, ha he knows the need of the farmers because he has worked with them for 40 years. So what if you don't have your uh, domain expertise? And it is imperative to spend your network. So this is a company that we invested from Canada, uh, from Toronto. And then what they do is that they have developed a 3D scanner for the mining industry. So whenever you blast a mine, it needs to be a um, archeologist needs to go down there and just measure the mines the surfaces, make sure that's safe. So what they have done is that they have used a uh, 3D scanner and just mapped the mine autonomously, right? And able to detect the faces and able to generate a report in a very short amount of time to say, hey, is the mine safe? You can go in. So you will imagine that, you know, like someone like that, the team is going to be very mature, very old woman who's been in the industry for years. Uh, she, you know, she, uh, she started this after her fourth year in college in Kingston, uh, Canada. And then she, the, the reason why she's able to go into different markets that's predominantly do dominated by uh, older, uh, older, older gentlemen, is that she goes to every single conference in North America that she was mining, right? And it's, uh, you know, like it's a, it's more about preservation, uh, preserving your, and uh, keep getting this knowledge and keep networking and keep understanding and keep trying to get into the network, which is going to be essential to the success of your business, right? So um, that's what that's what I have. Uh, essentially. Um, Shenzhen for us is really to access the world's best technology investors, partners, experts, and putting in one location that can able to uh, help your business thrive. I'm going to leave the last slide here, which is a uh, a, a a film reel to to showcase some of the, some of our startups, some of our uh, some of our space in Shenzhen, and also Shenzhen itself. So with that, I will uh, pass it back to uh, uh, um, oops, sorry, pass it back to Marcus. All right, uh, G, thank you uh, very much for uh, your insights. You have given to us uh, about uh, Hex uh, Accelerator. So we still have uh, about 15 minutes time to address the questions the audience have uh, given uh, to us uh, during your two uh, speeches. 
Some of the questions have already been answered in a written form by uh, Jan, I have seen. However, I still want to take uh, some of the questions again for the entire uh, audience. I try to structure uh, the questions uh, a bit. I think we have four topics which uh, are of interest. Of interest. First, again, how to start a business in Shenzhen, maybe also as uh, compared to Shanghai or Beijing. Second, how to finance a business when we are a startup and want to come to Shenzhen. Then, of course, like the question of uh, IP protection and then some question about and of course, the current situation, the COVID-19 situation, how, is, how it has influenced the business in Shenzhen and how it will be in uh, maybe a couple of years. So I would like to, again, let's uh, maybe address the first um, topic, starting um, a business in Shenzhen. There is one question, I think, which is very interesting from uh, Re Re Regina or Regina. Uh, she uh, wants to know what actions would be necessary again and again in order to start a business in Shenzhen? Also, what is absolutely essential if I'm a foreign startup, if I want to be successful using the Shenzhen ecosystem, the Shenzhen innovation ecosystem as a startup? Any of you, Jan or Ji, do you have an opinion on this uh, question? Sure, I'll, I'll take a crack at it uh, first. So I, I think the answer depend, really depends on uh, who your customer and where your customers are located, right? If it's located in, in, in China or in Shenzhen, that's gonna have a very different answer than your, your, uh, if your customer is gonna be located back in Europe. Uh, if, it's in, if it's back in Europe, uh, you might not need to start a business in Shenzhen, but many on how do you uh, utilize the Shenzhen ecosystem to accelerate your business. Uh, versus if you want to start a business in uh, in Shenzhen for a local economy, for the Asia economy, that's different, completely different answers. Then it's going to be a lot of support from uh, uh, from opening a business as a Wufi uh, or your own foreign entity, or if you want to do a to join VC, or if you want to uh, uh, utilize the local accelerators or incubators to start something um, very local. Right. So I think that depends on uh, depends on where where you're coming from. I think yeah, I have a I have a more detailed. No, absolutely. Okay. I think you you summarized it very well. I think it would be really interesting to learn more about your company your industry so that we can maybe give you better insights. So uh, maybe you can, you can type it in the, in the, in the Q and A, just give us a little bit more insights about what you're specifically trying to do. Then I think I will be able to give you more, you know, practical insights, but otherwise I absolutely agree with what she said just now. And uh, you know, there is many, I, I know that some people were asking about this starting company in Shenzhen, you know, there's many, many policies and I personally predict that after this COVID-19, it's actually gonna even more accelerate. The government is gonna be giving even more support because of course they will have to, you know, make it up for the lost time now for those three, four, six, all seven, right, eight right. months. I don't know how, how much time you're gonna lose, but uh, you know, if you're ready and if you pay attention to these things, I think you could actually, there could be a window of opportunity for you as a startup to get really good deal on an office support, free services, free taxes, etc. So just keep that in mind, and you know, hopefully you can find somebody to to help you navigate this. Be it Swiss Next or be it somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess this uh, can be linked uh, to another question that John Evans has uh, asked uh, again. Although he addresses uh, like even accelerators or organizations like uh, Swiss Next, what kind of support? they can actually provide to startups coming to Shenzhen. So, um, he mentions that very often it's a focus on technology. However, I mean, what would it be that you provide that you can, or in what way can you support uh, these startup companies when they, when they uh, want to use uh, Shenzhen or maybe China in general as a, as, a, as a place to accelerate business? 
Yes, for the Swiss startups, uh, at, actually we prepare a slide later. We'll show we have an initial uh, camp program that offer to our Swiss startup for the soft landing program in Shenzhen. So you'll see later all our uh, offerings and uh, please contact us for more details. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. Okay, great. Um, then I would like to go to the second block uh, uh, of questions. I'm able to keep uh, the time on the control financing a business. Uh, but there has been uh, one question addressing the VCs and private equity in Shenzhen. According to you, to the two speakers' experience, how willing are VCs and uh, private equity uh, providers in Shenzhen to finance? early stage uh, projects also compared to other places like uh, Shanghai or Beijing? All right. Uh, I, I, I will, I'll offer from a uh, slightly different angle. And I think Yen, uh, Jens will have a, a, from a very, a very more direct answer to, to this particular question. So the way I see it, and then how most of the hacks companies are funded, how most hacks foreign companies are funded, in, uh, is not directly through uh, Shenzhen local uh, VCs. That we see a change in this as more local VCs are opening up to fund uh, foreign companies, but by far, still most hacks. Uh, companies are actually funded by uh, foreign VCs. And, however, Shenzhen still plays a huge part in this because Shenzhen is a centralized location for a lot of VCs who's looking for deals. Right? And then that this have a very, a lot of the companies are actually funded by Hong Kong VCs or Japanese VCs who comes over or Korea VCs or U European VCs who, when they're looking for deals, they want to have a go to one place that have a lot of startups that's um, that available for them to, to take a look. And they want to look at tangible items in tangible locations and then okay. doing actual, actual, uh, actual things. And then Shenzhen becomes a breeding ground for those kind of startups. So vast majority of our companies got introduced to VCs while they're in Shenzhen and which led them to the seed round. All yeah, right. I can um, just add on that. Yes, young, can I? please. Okay, I can just add on that. Yeah, this is a great insight. I think, you know, it really comes down to the, the fact Shenzhen being the hub, being the community, being the hotspot. And, you know, still I do believe that there is so much more that we can do, we can collectively do to make it even better. And that's what we are working on. And so I believe that, or I, I personally kind of see it in my mind already that it's going to get better for sure in the, in the near future. And uh, what I would like to just add, it's really about, again, being practical. So set the expectations in a way that, uh, as I mentioned, even in the presentation, that if you're a foreign company, even if the VC wants to invest, maybe they might not be able to invest. You know, there is an example, for example, I'm not going to uh, name any names right now, but, you know, there's many government funded funds and these funds have a specific directions given by the government. And so, uh, you know, you have to have a specific setup of your company to be able to receive funding at first place, you know, and uh, that's, that's just one example. Uh, the second example is, uh, you know, that uh, you actually, if you want to receive money from a purely Chinese fund, you know, you have to first decide if you actually even want it. You know, there is many actually, you know, there is many foreign funds that operate in China that might be even better value for you, you know, at the very beginning, just figuring out the market uh, before you learn how to deal with the Chinese VCs, how to deal with the Chinese uh, people being on your board, on your cap table and stuff like that. So, you know, that's really something that you have to be very practical about and consider all different implications and talk to people, even talk to people like Hux, you know, what's their experience, you know, their companies probably raised uh, follow on rounds and, you know, they know how to navigate this process, right? So you really want to make yourself or make, make it clear for yourself and for the, you know, even further investors, future investors. So, you know, there's really, you know, a lot of nuances, a lot of things that, a lot of details that will, you know, determine your success. And so I would absolutely recommend, you know, to talking to multiple people, not just one expert, but talking uh -huh, to multiple uh -huh. people to okay. get different perspectives. Maybe I can uh, just add here one more question, I think, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, but the, the question is from, uh, I think, CJ Chua. At what stage uh, 
should a startup uh, start to cooperate with uh, VCs or, uh, or with an accelerator at the very beginning? Or would uh, these uh, startups already need to have a certain, say, time behind them before they would come to Shenzhen? So what the, what's the level, the, the stage you would recommend a startup to engage in Shenzhen? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll go first again. Um, uh, it depends on what, you, what you're making. Uh, if it's hardware, uh, if it's very high tech hardware, it's probably going to require some kind of. Uh... Sorry, sorry, my kid is here. <laughs> yeah, school has been closed for three months. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, anyways, where was I? So yes, it really depends on what, what startup you're making, right? What kind of technology you're making, right? If it's a, if it's a very high tech technology that's uh, able to, you need to, you need to demonstrate from a very easy proof of concept. I think that the example I gave about that uh, tire inspection robot is a great great level to approach VCs, right? And that is what get them to have um, roughly 250k uh, US dollars in funding. Just have a demonstration unit that's able to prove that, hey, a couple months later, I'm gonna have something that's able to run in a bus station. Um, and then that changes as you approach a, an app, all right? If you are doing a service, and then if you're doing a um, doing a educational platform, then Miza, Miza, the KPI might be how many users you have, right? Or how many, what are the, the, the differentiating factor uh, that you have. So uh, it really depends. And, but for most VCs, as about to give you a pre-seed angel money, you need to demonstrate the biggest uh, risk factor that you have with your particular business. All right, so uh, thank you very much, uh, G. So considering the time, I would like to go to the very last question. One short answer from uh, both of you. Of course, the current situation, the COVID-19 situation we are going through, we don't really know exactly how long it still uh, will last. But nevertheless, what is your prospect, your forecast for the next, say, maybe one, two, three years uh, in terms of Shenzhen as the place to be or to still be for foreign startups? If you can give a short answer. Both of you, Jan and G. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think I already answered that in my presentation. So, you know, I'm still, I'm still truly bullish. I think, you know, the fact that we have lost some time, and you know, we're probably going to keep losing some time in the near future because of the travel bans and everything. It's not going to be very easy to navigate that in the near couple months. But I still believe that could uh, that could open many other windows for for foreign startups, especially in Shenzhen, in an open ecosystem as, as Shenzhen actually is. So, you know, yeah, that's just a short answer. I'm, I'm, I'm truly bullish. I'm staying here. I'm not going anywhere. And so if you guys come here, over here, just uh, let's have a beer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it's, it's a very interesting question. And it's going to get a lot, asked a lot for the past few weeks. Um, so for some startups, it's going to be detrimental. Uh, because of virus, right? If you're in the construction business, or if you're in the service business, or in the hotel business, aviation business, it's going to have a hard time. However, that also leads to a lot of opportunities for some other uh, other 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 sectors, right? So medical, for example, uh, automation, robotics, is all sectors that are going to flourish because of this, or remote healthcare, uh, for example. So, uh, and it also leads to a lot of opportunities for fast pivots. Uh, the robot example I just gave, they are now cleaning uh, in a uh, in bunch of hospitals, including Wuhan hospitals, by having an autonomous navigation indoor for using UV lights to disinfect. They're shipping a couple of robots to Europe to help in Italy uh, at the moment. And those are opportunities that, as a startup, you're nimble enough to navigate. You know, we, have, we just invested a company that's doing a, a service in the aviation industry. They are pivoting because every industry is not going to make investments in the next year or two, right? But because you're a startup, you are, by definition, much more nimble than Boeing, for example, right? If Boeing is not making aircraft, what can they make? Uh, so, so these are the opportunities that you, you want to utilize uh, during this time. Okay, so uh, Jan and G, thank you very much uh, for having taken time uh, today for us to give us your insights 
and your experiences uh, from navigating in the business and uh, ecosystem of uh, Shenzhen. Uh, the famous uh, Wayne Dyer once uh, said, don't die with your music still in you, referring to that we all should venture and realize all the ideas, all the dreams and the plans we have and I think you were, you have shown to us that uh, even though currently we are still in some troubling times, we have and can have a positive uh, prospect for the next uh, time uh, to come. And Shenzhen for sure should be and will be a place where many startups uh, engage and uh, uh, build and accelerate their business. So thanks very much uh, for your time and your insights. And with this, I hand over back uh, to Vijen to uh, round up and close uh, today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Many thanks to our two speakers, your time and uh, excellent input. And uh, we'd like also express our gratitude to our moderator, Marcos, and our audience, your active interaction with the speakers and uh, bring up these valuable questions. So I apologize for the time limitation. Our webinar is close to end, uh, but we'll leave our contact way in the last page. If you have any further questions, so please send them to us. We will transmit the questions to the speaker and uh, give it back to you. And uh, one more highlight for Swiss startups who would have further inquiries on opportunity for a soft landing program in China. A good news comes that we are launching InnoSwiss Shenzhen Camp to offer customized sports by connecting with the relevant stakeholders there. So please contact us for more details. Once again, thanks to all for your engagement. Please stay tuned with us for our next webinar about Shenzhen, the way of open innovation, new partnership model with hardware ecosystem on May 7th. Please follow us on our social medias. Wish you all have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.